And now I'd like to introduce our presenter uh, today, um, Wesley Book. And um, Wesley uh, is currently a registered psychologist who practices in the area of clinical and rehabilitation psychology. He's also a former ordained minister and is currently on the ordination track for the United Church of Canada. Following his internship in the psychology department of the WorkSafe BC uh, program, he uh, continued to work there in criminal injury cases, complex case management, and especially interdisciplinary rehabilitation. In 1996, West became manager of the pain programs at WorkSafe BC and supervisor of the provincial network of pain programs, all responsibilities that continues his interests in treatment and innovation, outcome, and quality assurance. In 97, he co-founded Behavioral Healthcare with an interest in individually tailored cognitive behavioral approaches to chronic conditions that emphasize the home, community facilities, and workplace as a rehabilitation clinic. Currently, uh, Dr. Buck uh, focuses on psycholegal assessment of the core purposes, the treatment of complex forms of human suffering such as fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, and chronic fatigue syndrome, as well as research in pain-related spheres and caregiver burnout. Wes recently became the consulting psychologist to the new Complex Chronic Diseases Program at BC Women's Hospital. And uh, Wes is especially proud of his business partner, Dr. Elizabeth Bannerman, for her initiative with the ALS Society of British Columbia to develop a network of counselors and psychologists who volunteer free services to ALS patients and their caregivers. To learn more about behavioral health care and the work of uh, Wesley Book, please visit behavioralhealthcare.com. Welcome, Wesley. Welcome, and thank you. Um, and welcome to everyone who's listening. Um, it wasn't that long ago, Michael, that uh, I was doing a radio show on Pain BC uh, about chronic pain and mental health. Um, today, we're going to uh, look at a two-part series on chronic pain and spirituality, finding meaning in the misery. Uh, in these two sessions, I'm hoping to link up pain and suffering, spirituality, and good pain self-management in a way that's clear, useful, and encouraging. So here's what I'm trying to say. Basically, we are meaning makers who are writing our life story every day. Spirituality is about meanings of ultimate concern that inform our story. Everyone is spiritual but not necessarily religious. Pain and suffering reveal our spirituality. Our spirituality, in turn, may be informing the meanings we attach to pain. Our spirituality can help and hinder pain and mood management, and we can modify meanings related to pain. We can change the plot line of our pain story. We can start a new chapter. That's what I'm hoping to communicate over our two sessions. And if you ever get lost, and I hope you don't, um, you can always go back to that slide, and that's actually what I'm trying to say. But wait. Isn't spirituality a bit of a hairball? Isn't spirituality a topic that opens up all kinds of controversy, hard feelings, endless arguments that go nowhere? For example, there's the word spirit in spirituality. How many people out there today believe in a spirit world? Well, it turns out that lots do and lots don't. And how many of you are hooked on the TV show Supernatural? I'd ask for a raise of hands, but I can't see you. And what about religions? Doesn't the very word bring up TV images of people with bombs strapped to their chests? Or the scandal of child abuse? Or the cultural genocide and abuse of our own First Nations people? Or some tele-evangelist who puts on quite the show and rakes in a whole pile of money? Don't religious beliefs lead people to become narrow-minded and exclusive, rejecting all other points of view? In other words, isn't spirituality a hairball that we don't want to get all wrapped up in? So 
uh, the points you raise are all great ones, um, Wes. So why are we even here? Why should we even raise the topic of spirituality? Which um, really is the question to ask. Why even raise spirituality in this context of chronic pain and chronic suffering? Because uh, in this webinar, I suggest that we all are spiritual in some way, that spirituality is not just for religious folk, and our spirituality can very much affect how we manage pain and suffering. When I talk about suffering, I think of all the things that come from chronic pain, um, like anxiety and depression. For example, if my spirituality or religion tells me that my pain is karma for evil deeds that I committed in a past life, then um, why should I learn pain self-management? What if I believe that pain is a form of divine punishment for my sins in this life, or one of my ancestors' sins? What if I believe that everyone in this existence is predetermined and everything? How would that affect my motivation for pain management and rehabilitation? So I'm really trying to get here, Michael, at core beliefs, core spiritual understandings, and how they work behind the scenes in all of this, to either bring further despair, uh, to bring hope, to mess up pain rehab, or actually to enhance it. So I could say, on the other hand, what if spirituality offers me a community of love and practical support? so that I don't feel so alone and helpless in my pain? And what if my spirituality provides me with a perspective on pain and suffering that helps me to accept it, to endure it, and to commit myself to helpful actions for the good of my health and others? What if my spirituality provides me with practices or rituals that give me encouragement, hope, and even are good for pain self-management? So what I'm suggesting is that spirituality is part of what makes us human. It can be both helpful and unhelpful to pain management and alleviation of suffering. And it's our job to examine our innate spirituality, embrace the good for the betterment of ourselves and, other, uh, and others, and modify our spirituality when it's unhealthy for us. So, Michael, I think it's time for a poll. All right. So we're going to open a poll to our attendees here. You should see it pop up. And um, the, the first question will pop up, which is, do you consider yourself a spiritual person? You'll have some options. And once you select your option, press Submit, and we'll get a sense of um, our audience's position on this question. I'm opening the poll now. So we're having some uh, in progress. We're having lots of answers. I'm going to give people a little, uh, a few more seconds to put in their answers and, and submit. Anybody else? Um, oh, look, we have a few more people chiming in with their – this is obviously a question that requires a little bit of uh, introspection and thought. Okay, it looks like we've got a very good response rate here. I'm going to close the poll, and um, I'm going to share the uh, poll results with our attendees. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know here that – 67% um, of our attendees uh, answered yes, they consider themselves a spiritual per, uh, person. We had no people, zero, um, uh, write that they did not consider themselves a spiritual person. And we had three uh, folks, or 7% of our attendees, reply that they don't know. And you can see those poll results now as I share them uh, with our attendees. So, Wes, it looks like we've got a very spiritual group with us here. 67% of our attendees consider themselves a spiritual person. And, you know, um, that's kind of in keeping with um, at least a lot of what I run into on the West Coast. 
a lot of people are willing to say that they're spiritual, uh, not necessarily religious. Um, and I am, of course, uh, so interested in the different modes and practices and understandings of spirituality that people, people bring to their life and to their uh, life with chronic pain. And I'm very interested in the 7% that aren't sure that they're spiritual. Um, because sometimes uh, people get very turned off by this subject for all sorts of reasons. So I want to respect that and let those 7% know that I'm not trying to convert you into be, seeing yourself as a spiritual person. Um, although I do want to give you an alternative way of looking at spirituality that might allow you to believe that spirituality is for all. It's for everyone. Mm -hmm. So at this point, um, I'm going to encourage our attendees to send in your comments or questions on the material so far. What does spiritual being spiritual mean to you? Um, uh, you know, you don't need to write a, a huge paragraph, but you know, maybe give us your your one-line thoughts on on. Um, spirituality and if you've always considered yourself spiritual and how big a role it plays in your life and I'm sending that out as a um, as a chat so um, and we'll we'll continue on with the um, webinar but as you're um, as you are um, listening uh, if a thought or a comment or question comes to you please feel free to send it along I've got a a uh, comment here uh, from an attendee uh, that basically says, uh, I'm a spiritual being living life within a physical body. It puts a different perspective on chronic pain self-management. Um, and Wes, feel free to jump in here and, and uh, comment on any of, our, of the input that we're getting from people. I have a comment here, spirituality provides me with hope. Another, being spiritual means finding meaning hope and purpose uh, in God. Spirituality is an integrated part of life with or without pain. Um, we have someone here, I'm a Christian and I have a great relationship with my God. Uh, spirituality is a safe place to reflect about what's going on with me in a broader context. Another person, still figuring it out. I look at many philosophies and I'm not sure how I view the concept of God. Uh, being connected to the universe equals a greater purpose. And yeah. Another comment here, my attitude is my primary tool for managing pain, and spirituality informs my attitude. So we've got, obviously, we've got some very um, uh, smart and um, introspective attendees out there who uh, you know, could, be t could be teaching the course uh, themselves. We are learning a lot from, from them. Wes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I do want to say that um, I'm so glad that uh, you're all chatting in and uh, giving us your feedback. Um, I'm not uh, an expert per se on spirituality. Um, I come from a Judeo-Christian background, um, but it's not a particularly uh, traditional one. Um, and I'm uh, very interested in all the diversity of people out there and would love to hear uh, also from people who um, do not believe in God and yet consider themselves spiritual. I'd love to hear from people that, for instance, are Buddhist and uh, uh, who would espouse a non-theist faith, which is that um, there is no God in particular. Um, but they nevertheless are devoutly spiritual and have a great spiritual practice. And, of course, there are people like um, uh, people who come from the Hindu faith or the Sikh faith, um, that are going to have a different take on this as well. Um, and there are people that won't be, that will be out there not attending any particular synagogue, church, temple, or anything, not organized religion, um, but they'll think of themselves as deeply spiritual as they go for a hike um, and behold the, the beauty of nature, for instance. So we still have a piece to go in defining what is spiritual and uh, what is religious. Yeah, well, well I just want to, uh, touch on a few more comments I'm receiving here. One that resonates for me, uh, an attendee writes, for me, spirituality is about the interconnectedness of things. Um, where did it go? Here we go. 
including my pain. For me, spirituality is about the interconnectedness of things, including my pain. It reminds me of the of a quote by a um, philosopher, uh, Martin Buber, who said that God is between people uh, and between things. So that, that comment is sort of uh, in keeping with that philosophy, that spirituality is really about relationships and connections between things. People... Um, uh, uh, many of our attendees mentioning their, their Buddhist practice, um, someone expressing their uncertainty whether they believe in God, though they were raised Christian and remain spiritual. Another who's so thankful for their faith and the hope to come, thankful for the grace that they receive each day to get through the day. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, the idea of uh, nature and art. Um, a question, does feeling uplifted by nature and art make you spiritual? I guess so. Uh, meditation helps me connect with my spiritual self and become an observer of my pain. It allows me to reduce my secondary psychological pain and even my physical primary pain. Which is really Wonderful. important, incidentally, Michael, because, um, and Buddhist practitioners out there know this, um, this ability to um, distance yourself from your immediate pain experience can be very helpful. And in one form of um, uh, psychotherapy and psychological treatment for chronic pain, uh, which is called acceptance and commitment therapy, um, it's the answer to a kind of um, enmeshment in your pain, a fusion with your pain so that you can't see anything else in your life but pain. And the distancing or detachment, as some Buddhists would call it, is what helps you with that, uh, undo that enmeshment, uh, undo that fusion, so that you start to be able to see other things in your life, other plot lines in your life, other people in your life, as opposed to being entirely preoccupied by your pain, which of course is inherently preoccupying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, is it time for another poll question? Although I, I, have, a, I have a feeling I know how this is going to go, but should we ask the second in this series of, of questions? Sure. Okay, so the second one uh, that I'm, that I'm going to open right now is, do you think that your spirituality is relevant to your pain experience or pain management? Opening the poll now, let's get the feedback from our um, attendees here. Let's see if we can get everybody with some answer, even if it's, I don't know. Just allowing people a few more seconds to submit their answers. Closing the poll, we have, oh, we have a few more people submitting responses, but the preliminary result is that we have 57% of our uh, respondents are saying yes, uh, they do believe that spirituality is relevant to their pain experience. We have nobody, again, saying that it isn't, and some people unsure. At 11% of the respondents, I'm uh, saying I don't know whether spirituality is relevant to pain management, and I'm sharing poll results with you there. And, and oh, great. Uh, at this point, Wes, maybe we'll continue on with the, with the webinar. Great. Yes, and of course, I'm very curious about uh, the 57% and how their spirituality informs um, their life with pain and their management of pain. Um, and I would uh, be very interested also in the 11% who say, well, I, I don't really know. Um, and I don't, and it might be that I don't really know because I'm not sure it's relevant, um, which is just fine. The purpose of my uh, presentation over the next couple, uh, over these two sessions, is to suggest that there might be ways in, you, in which you can access a spirituality that you might even not thought you had, um, and that might be informing your pain experience in ways that you didn't think of. Um, and if you want to think of a more scientific model about this, it would be the cognitive behavioral model in which, um, for instance, two researchers, Guidano and Liotti, um, uh, talk a lot about core beliefs. Um, you might call them hot 
thoughts, uh, very deeply entrenched, perhaps for long periods of time, very closely connected to feeling experiences, uh, core meanings that uh, are operating behind the scenes. So um, I, I want the 11% to stay tuned <laughs> because they may want to change their answer or not. So shall we continue with the next slide, Michael? Absolutely. All right. So um, perhaps some of you are, you know, there's a small percentage that are saying, I, I really don't know about this whole spirituality thing and whether I'm spiritual or not. It's time to talk about how I would define spirituality and religion and um, how the two differ. I'm defining uh, spirituality as our quest for meaning, for all that is of ultimate importance to us. So since we're all meaning makers, I'm assuming that we all have a spiritual aspect to our lives. Spirituality is for everyone, and since we all attach meaning to our pain, such meaning may have relevance to our spiritual understandings, for better or for worse. So let's take a look at some examples of ultimate importance. If spirituality is about meanings that are about ultimate uh, things, ultimate questions, what would some of this uh, meanings of ultimate importance be about? Well, um, how about the nature of our existence? For example, Buddhism refers to this life as characterized by impermanence and suffering. This might lead a Buddhist practitioner with chronic pain to not feel so surprised that this person has pain, since suffering, in one form or another, is what we should expect in this life. So just get on with it. How about the nature of our consciousness as something of ultimate importance? Some are deeply committed to the notion of a universal consciousness that is shared with all living things. This gets at, Michael, that comment from one of our listeners about the interconnectedness of all things. Um, and a person with chronic pain who holds such a belief might feel like a special close, uh, closeness and concern to all living things that suffer like animals that are poached and slaughtered in cruel ways. Such a person may choose to volunteer in an animal shelter or adopt an animal. This might result in greater motivation to move despite pain. Like we all know if you have a dog, you've got to take the dog for a walk. So caring for an animal might be good for mental health and very much connected with a kind of consciousness, a universal consciousness that is shared with all living things. Well, how about another meaning of ultimate importance that might be out there? The meaning of birth and death, or even life after death. Some re religious traditions believe in karma, others in heaven, hell, or purgatory. A belief in some sort of afterlife may make a person more hopeful to persevere because heaven awaits, or not. And we've already heard from several that know that their spirituality um, gives them hope in this life. And how about the meaning of our relationship to our planet? This is a big one. Um, perhaps one of my top, you know, three or so uh, favorite Christian theologians, uh, Albert Schweitzer. Uh, he was a theologian, philosopher, musician, and physician, and had four doctorates. I'm not jealous, I'm just saying. Um, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his phrase, reverence for life, and his tireless efforts to preserve life in Africa. Some people refer to our planet as Gaia, a web of living, interconnected, interdependent relationships that forms a kind of planetary consciousness. Now, a person with chronic pain may feel comforted and less lonely by returning to the earth such as one of my pain patients who has become quite the serious gardener. Now let's move on and uh, I want to say that you're going to notice that spirituality, at least as I define it, does not necessarily require a belief in God, gods, spirits, supernatural events, or powers. Although traditionally these have often uh, been associated with spirituality. In fact, there is now an emerging term called secular spirituality, for people who have a deep sense of the sacred, 
but without any belief at all in supernatural entities. In Christianity, there are folk of deep spiritual uh, spirituality who practice their faith without belief in God. Um, I think of, for instance, Greta Vospers, Reverend uh, Greta Vospers uh, from Ontario, who is a United Church minister and um, someone who considers herself a progressive Christian, and she does not uh, understand her Christianity as um, a belief in God. Buddhism is a spiritual tradition that does not worship a god or gods. Um, Spirituality differs from religion in that religion is an organized form or system of spirituality. Religion is structured spirituality. In organized religion, there are prescribed beliefs and rituals that may claim a long and historical lineage. Religions from the Latin root religare, which means to tie. For some, religion ties together the loose threads of spirituality and their life into a coherent system. For others, religion just ties people up in knots. Now, Canada is a multicultural society that is rich in diverse spiritualities and religious traditions, so it would not be surprising that Canadians with chronic pain would be informed in some way by such spiritualities and religions. I don't think it's an area, frankly, um, amongst us who assess and treat people with chronic pain that we look at uh, seriously enough. And um, geographical areas may share certain common spiritual characteristics. And my favorite example of this is um, in 2008, Douglas Todd, the Vancouver Sun staff writer uh, on spirituality and religion, edited a book called Cascadia, the Elusive Utopia, Exploring the Spirit of the Pacific Northwest. Here's part of the publishing blurb, and I quote, This book will appeal to anyone who wants to understand the unique culture and spirituality of the fast-growing Pacific Northwest, which includes British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. My apologies, incidentally, to the listeners who don't come from this area. But... Um, goes on to say, envied by people around the world. Cascadia, as it is known, is remarkable for its famed mountains, evergreens, eagles, beaches, and livable cities. Sounds like I'm doing a blurb for a tourist BC, doesn't it? Most people, however, do not realize that Cascadia, named after the religion's cascading, uh, the region's cascading waterfalls, is also home to the least institutionally religious people on the continent. Despite their unusual resistance to old ways of doing religion, Cascadia, the elusive utopia, argues that most of the 14 million residents of this rugged land are eclectically, informally, often deeply spiritual. End of quote. So I say, at least for all of us on the wet coast, Consider yourself tagged as deeply spiritual, including the, what was it, 7% who didn't think they were. So maybe it's time after that to have a wee chat. What do you think, Michael? It sounds, yeah, absolutely. And we've been, we've been receiving some uh, comments from people uh, while you've been going through this um, exploration of the difference between spirituality and religion and this fascinating idea of Cascadian spirituality. Um, we have people writing in, um, I don't know what my spirituality is. I guess it is some little hope I can grab hold of for whatever time it lasts. Um, and then another person saying that, that they find that their spirit is disconnected with my interconnectedness with everything around me because my thoughts are so focused on my pain experience. So the idea of pain interfering with this spiritual idea of interconnectedness. Yeah. Is there any, anything you could say about that, Wes? Well, I, I think that pain is this huge bulldozer 
that, you know, goes into our mind and bulldozes everything in sight and says, hello, I'm going to replace that with me. Um, pain is a survival mechanism that we're hardwired to pay attention to. It's basically something that's kept us alive. If we didn't have it, um, we'd be in deep trouble. So um, it's just when that pain gets stuck and keeps on telling us things that um, may no longer be true. Like we have some great area of, of damage in our body that needs instant repair. Well, we may know exactly what's going on with our body and what we can do about it. We don't need pain to keep telling us over and over and over again that that's what's going on. And yet, that's what pain kind of does. It's like that, that um, obnoxious alarm system in your house that went off in my house a couple of days ago and um, freaked me out because, I don't know, something, I think it was a piece of toast was burning in the toaster. And now it's like we got this huge fire in the house, which we didn't. But it sounded like, wow, what's all this? And it was hard to turn off. Um, I think people deal with that all the time, and it blitzes out, bulldozes out lots of other kinds of thoughts and feelings, like love um, and peace and stillness and interconnectedness with other people um, and puts blinders on them. And talk about trying to connect with deeper meanings in life. How are you supposed to do that if pain is blaring at you all the time? Incidentally, right. um, you know, uh, a form of torture is to turn up really loud music all the time. People can't think straight. They start to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. That's pain. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, we have somebody commenting that um, on this idea of the uh, Pacific Northwest being a, uh, you know, a, a spiritual center, like a mecca of sorts for people who find their spirituality through connection to nature. Uh, she writes that, uh, I now know why I'm so much happier here in BC than I was in Ontario. <laughs> and uh -oh. my organized religion back there. So maybe we'll get some people uh, chiming in, uh, defending <laughs> defending uh, Ontario area, as we used to call it. <laughs> um, uh, we also have uh, somebody who uh, maybe would qualify as a Cascadian spiritualist who writes, I definitely have an eclectic type of spirituality, nature, native, Buddhist, new thought. So there certainly is, it seems, a wide, wide range of ways to access this spirituality. And could I um, just put something out okay. here at this point um, before we get into interprovincial warfare? Um, <laughs> um, and that is, I'm going to advance just an idea I want you to think about out there with regard to spirituality and religion. First of all, I have a deep respect, obviously, for religion. I'm part of one. Um, as um, a way of practicing um, and a spiritual impulse. I mean, where did religion come from if it wasn't from spiritual impulses? And where did they come from if it wasn't trying to figure out what the heck is going on in this life? Uh, what is my existence about? You know, the big questions. So the, the, the thing I'm trying to advance here is that ultimately, like you just said about this uh, person who was talking about an eclectic faith, I want to suggest to you that um, we are all at the end of the day. We are all the, uh, the last stop. We are the arbiters. We are the ones who choose what we are to believe. Now, I know that we get, in my case, I was raised in a very, very conservative Christian home, and I know that that's deeply imprinted in me, um, and it's been very hard for me to individu individuate myself from and come up with my own adult form of spirituality in contrast to that, taking some and leaving other bits. But at the end of the day, even for those of us that have religions or spiritualities that are informed by books like scriptures that are said to be supernaturally inspired or supernatural revelations, whether orally or in print or both, I'm going to suggest to you that at the end of the day, it is you who is the final arbiter as to what you're going to understand as being accurate or in some sense true for yourself. 
And if you do that uh, and are willing to distance yourself just a little bit once in a while, I think it makes, uh, from your um, prescribed understandings, I think it makes for a great um, challenge and a, and a better uh, and richer uh, faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've received one comment here before we move on. Um, and, you know, being uh, living with chronic pain, and especially when uh, it's such a complex uh, problem, and many healthcare practitioners don't have the tools and training they need to properly deal with pain. Um, you get a lot of hopelessness, and uh, somebody writes that pain coping has become more difficult lately as after this month her pain specialist told her that he was giving up and that there were no more answers. Oh. And as the pain increases, it affects her brain. When I lose control of the thinking process, there is no life. So how, how can somebody that's losing hope um, use or access this spirituality? Yeah, and that's just the way to put it. So my heart goes out to this person. Um, um, my first answer is, um, as I think of this, is a dear friend of mine uh, in earlier in her life when she was just going through some really awful times, um, and there was no medical a answer for her, and her physician looked at her in despair and said, I think I'm about done. You need to see a priest. <laughs> so that was the um, situation there. Um, I would want to encourage this person that um, I believe um, that there uh, is in everyone uh, really important meanings about this life and about uh, chronic pain that are wise. And um, it takes time. Um, this can be done in treatment to access these because they'll pop out sometimes when you least expect them. Sometimes they can be traced through your behavior or actually through the very nature of your pain. Uh, they can be traced in looking at your life story, which we'll be coming to before too long. Um, and, of course, to uh, talk to other people who um, perhaps have some uh, understanding of spirituality of whatever kind. I just love all the diversity that I'm seeing in the chats today um, and see what's really uh, something that speaks to you. Oh, we have so many questions pouring in, um, Wesley. Uh, I think we're, we are, because we have 15 minutes left, um, maybe we should try to get through some more um, of the material and answer some of these questions if we have time at the end of the session or at the beginning of next session. What do you think? Um, you know what? I, oh, I'm looking at one question here from Joanna Pani who says, why do I need to suffer often horribly for the rest of my life? I'm only 36 in order for God's will to be done. What a great question. I can't leave that one. Um, yeah. And it's like I have the answer to that. Hello. Um, but uh, I'll take a crack at sort of getting it started. I would like to uh, just get at spirituality and its relevance to chronic pain um, because if we don't do that, then – we're not going to tie this unwieldy subject into something um, that begins to be practical for people. So I'm going to suggest that what we do is we advance to how is spirituality relevant to chronic pain. And I have a little homework assignment for everyone. Um, in fact, I've got two little projects that you may want to do. And then I will see if I can pick up some of these um, at the end. I think we have about, what, 10 more minutes or how much How much for time? About 15? About four, 14, 15 14 minutes. 14 minutes? Okay. So um, hang on there, people. Um, I just want to set up next session by talking about the relevance of uh, spirituality to chronic pain. And then I want to uh, talk about the homework assignments, if you're willing to take them on. Um, and then we're going to get to the questions, and I will do this in as short a way as I can. So up in front of you is how is spiritually re spirituality relevant to chronic pain? Um, I think it can be important to how you manage your pain, um, because for many folk with chronic pain, their daily suffering 
can provoke big questions about the meaning of their lives with pain, about life and death, about the vulnerability of our existence, about purpose, and perhaps about God or some universal consciousness. Like Joanna there, who said, well, what's up with this God if, um, you know, I'm 36 and looking at all this suffering? Um, yeah, I wish this God would give his or her head a shake. Now, you can answer these questions without any reference to spirituality or religion. I think you can. But for many people, these big questions in the face of suffering are hooked into spiritual beliefs and practices that can in turn affect the way they relate to their pain, the way they attach to their pain or detach from their pain, the way they manage their pain. I also think that spirituality can be important to normal mood and better quality of life despite pain. So mood is sort of like the other shoe that drops in chronic pain. It's your mood gets affected. You can get very anxious. You can get very gloomy. So how you answer these big questions of ultimate concern reveals your meaning system, which can have a profound effect on your mood. Here's a big question that I always ask my patients. How then shall I live a life worth living despite, well, fill in the blank. Usually it's constant pain or whatever it is, chronic depression. This is a question that helps me to access a person's meaning system, their values, their philosophy, their spirituality, their religion. Almost everyone I've worked with, regardless of their views on spirituality and religion, has been able to make changes in their mood and quality of life by reflecting on this question and finding small, meaningful activities that they do in a paced manner that are inspired by these meanings. Now, we need to talk about spirituality and chronic pain because for some people, their spirituality, let's face it, can complicate and worsen their suffering. For example, how might your mood be affected if you devoutly believed in the power of prayer, but after years of praying to become pain-free or just better in some way, there was absolutely no change at all? We also need to talk about how spirituality uh, about spirituality because uh, spiritual and religious traditions may have resources that help people cope with pain better, to find some measure of peace in the midst of their pain, or even specific techniques that help to reduce suffering. For example, meditation, mindfulness, centering prayer are all helpful contributions of our spiritual and religious traditions to pain management. In our secular society, we tend to strip the religious part away and focus on the actual practice or behavior. So how about yoga? This is a spiritual practice from Hinduism that got a lot of press in North America during the 60s social revolution. Mindfulness. This is a spiritual practice from Buddhism. Centering prayer. This is a spiritual practice from Christianity. Um, which has a lot in common with the um, mindfulness of Buddhism. In fact, I just want to put out there, one of uh, the theologians that I've been reading is Paul Knitter, K-N-I-T-T-E-R. He writes a great book called Without Buddha, I Couldn't Be Christian. So look it up. Um, lots of people strip away the religious language and values and just practice the spiritual technique, and they benefit so do people with chronic pain. So just look at the webinars on the Pain BC website about pain management advantages of yoga by Neil Pearson, a, uh, a, a physiotherapist and yoga instructor. And how about mindfulness by Linda Turner? They're all like on the website. And finally, lastly, we need to talk about spirituality because of an assumption that I have about human beings. That is, we're all spiritual in some way. This, this topic is for all, whether we know it or not. But we may not all choose to be religious. What's more, if we are in tune with our innate sense of spirituality, we might find hidden resources. And we might also find complications that help with or hinder pain and suffering. So um, 
I'm thinking it's uh, coming up time for more questions, but what I'm going to do is it, um, advance this slide to the homework. Um, we're not going to go to questions right away. Um, this is a photograph that I took uh, because I thought we're meaning makers and we spin meaning into stories, and that's just how our brain works. So my wife, Paula, is a kindergarten teacher, and she wouldn't ask her five-year-olds what the picture means. She would ask them to tell her a story about the picture. Um, and I'm wondering about your story. Um, the reason I took the picture was that this picture tells the story about how there is life in the midst of death. The tree is in fall, and all the leaves are off. And also death in the midst of life. Look at the ocean and the sky. Things are dynamic out there. They, they go together, life and death. I, I began to die as soon as I was born. Um, life and death, death and life. They sing a kind of duet. Now, next time, I'm going to move into this story more, this idea of a story, um, and your spiritual story. And I'm going to talk to you about plot twists. <laughs> and... I don't know how that got in there. Um, and here's the project that I'm wanting to interest you in. There's two of them. Um, and um, it's really about your life as a storybook. And I promise you that I will be going over next time this whole idea of you are a story and how that relates to cherished meanings in your life, plot lines, actions, what kind of a story you are, how that relates to a deep spirituality in you. But uh, take my word for it, we'll get to there. But in the meantime, notice that um, project one is to submit a, an, a short email outline of your pain story to date and send it to communications at painbc.ca. Is that right, Michael? That's right. And then comment on how your pain story is influenced by other stories in your past and by other plot lines in your present story. So your pain story isn't the only story you tell. There's lots of stories that you have about your life and other plot lines that are occurring in your life, like maybe you have a grandchild, maybe you have a new pet, maybe you're going somewhere and you have some sort of sense of adventure that's happening. And there's a story about that. Describe any of your spiritual meanings and practices and how they influence your experience and management of pain and mood now. Now, here's the deal. All of you that are willing to do this, this has to be submitted within a week because I need to review it, and I need to select one or two and show you how I use stories, people's pain story, um, and the story of their life, really, to find, to access um, meanings that are quite important, um, including spiritual meanings, meanings about ultimate concerns. And the other project, which neither of these, of course, you have to do, but you might say, well, I don't know, project number one's a bit much for me. Project number two, read Man's Search for Meaning, which today we would say uh, Humankind's Search for Meaning or um, Human Beings' Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, a Auschwitz um, survivor, a profound book. And Enjoy Every Sandwich by Lee Lipsenthal, um, another profound book, more recent, um, about one man's journey, about life and death, and uh, very helpful, I think, deeply spiritual. Um, so I'd love uh, submissions from you all. Um, I'm going to choose one or two. I'm, I'm going to show you how a rehabilitation psychologist works with pain and the meanings we attach to pain, and then how we can use some of that methodology to rewrite or edit our pain story towards something more hopeful. And then I'm going to go over to this slide, which says, again, what we're doing next time, we're going to review pain stories that relate spiritual meanings to pain and mood management. We're going to describe pain appraisal methodology and apply this to pain-related spiritual meanings. And I'll also give a little blurb on story because we didn't get to that today. There. Now we have a little time for chat. Wonderful. So I'm going to go back to some of the questions that have been texted in to us. Um, lots of 
people expressing uh, hopelessness and how okay, wanting ideas on how to get spirituality to overrule or override the pain bulldozer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, lots of uh, uh, people complaining of, of how they're expressing how their chronic pain is uh, reducing their mobility and reducing their quality of life, um, feeling isolated in pain and illness, uh, but that they're that they find that in seeking in philosophies like Stoicism, for example, it helps them to reframe their experience. Yeah, I've, I've heard from head. him, yeah. Yes, um, and uh, some people expressing how their spirituality is directly linked to their faith in God. Yes. Uh, others saying, my spirituality, my spirituality does not have anything to do with any God. My spirituality comes from my inner core values and what is important for me. Yeah, life. absolutely. I love this. This is exactly the kind of discussion we need to have so that we are not wasting this, uh, what I call, uh, what I consider a precious uh, innate inner resource. Um, uh, this is us sitting around fires trying to survive uh, previous uh, in our evolutionary history. And, and we're just uh, trying to figure things out. Can you imagine us at the dawn of our consciousness? Freud thought that that was traumatic for us. I suspect it might have been, or maybe it was a time of great awe and wonder. But we're trying to figure stuff out. And I believe we still do. We're given lots in childhood that we have to sift through, lots of stories in our childhood, some our own and some from others. We're trying to figure stuff out. Um, in some cases, it might be better for some people not to be involved with any meanings at all. Just detach yourself from all meanings because they drive you nuts. Um, on, on the other hand, there might be some meanings that once you get what they are, might be exactly the kind of other bulldozer or a very potent message that has half a chance of competing with pain and what pain is telling you. You see what I'm saying? It better be something potent. It better be something really powerful because pain comes in like a mega bulldozer and blasts everything in sight. So it better be something awfully potent. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. Well, Wes, we're, we're running out of time here. I, I want to leave with, uh, with two themes that seem to uh, summarize the rest of the comments. One is the idea of present moment um, focus and meditation and mindfulness and how a lot of people are saying that they're, uh, they're, they're using these techniques um, to deal with their pain with some success. Other, another theme that's coming up a lot is this idea of loneliness and disconnection from friends and family because of the chronic pain and how can you access spirituality if your idea of spirituality is all about interconnectedness when your pain disconnects you from so much. Right. Um, so uh, maybe we'll be able to pick up on that next week. I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing this conversation. Uh, I want to let everybody know that I'll be sending out a link to a recording of today's presentation along with, with instructions on the project and my email address to send them into. Uh, so thank you again, Wes, for spending time with us this afternoon. Yeah, and it's and, in two uh, weeks, Michael. It's in two weeks, not one week. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. That's right. It's on the 28th at noon. So that's not uh, this next Thursday, but the Thursday after that. Uh, thank you, Wes. And so we'll see everybody at Nove November 28th at noon. And until then, here's hoping that tomorrow is a day free from pain for all of us. Thank you, Wes. Thanks. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone.